Welcome to a session in the series titled Unpacking Anti-Terrorism, presenting discussion and analysis by leading Muslims from diverse backgrounds, including legal experts, public intellectuals, politicians, senators, community organizations, individuals and family members directly affected by post-9-11 anti-terror security legislation and regimes. On today's program, Dr. Omid Safi and Zul Suleiman discuss and analyze the legal processes and outcomes of the so-called Canada Day bomb plot, codenamed Project Souvenir by the RCMP. On June the 2nd, 2015, John Nuttall and Amanda Karodi were convicted by a jury of a number of terrorism offenses arising from the planting of explosive devices on the grounds of the legislature in Victoria, British Columbia on July 1st, 2013. However, those verdicts were stayed while the defense made its case of entrapment based on the conduct of the RCMP during its undercover investigation. On 29th August 2016, Madam Justice Bruce ultimately concluded there was an abuse of process, illegalities, and an inducement of an offense by the RCMP in this case. In her words, they were clearly overzealous and acted on the assumption that there were no limits to what was acceptable when investigating terrorism. Within their ranks, there were warnings given and ignored. There is clearly a need to curtail the actions of the police in a perspective sense to ensure that a future undercover investigations do not follow the same path. Moreover, to permit the defendant's conviction to stand in the face of this kind of police misconduct would be offensive and would cause irreparable damage to the integrity of the justice system. There are no remedies less drastic than a stay of proceedings that will address the abuse of process. The specter of the defendant serving a life sentence for a crime that the police manufactured by exploiting their vulnerabilities, by instilling fear that they would be killed if they backed out, and by quashing all doubts they had in religious justifications for the crime is offensive to our concept of fundamental justice. Simply put, the world has enough terrorists. We do not need the police to create more out of marginalized people who have neither the capacity nor sufficient motivation to do it themselves. End of quote. Discussing the John Nuttall and Amanda Crody case is Dr. Omid Safi, who was commissioned by the defense as an expert witness and immigration lawyer Zul Suleiman. Dr. Safi is an American professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies and the director of the Duke Islamic Studies Center. He is a distinguished and prolific scholar specializing in Islamic mysticism, contemporary Islamic thought, and medieval Islamic history. He is past chair for the study of Islam and the current chair for Islamic mysticism group at the American Academy of Religion. Omid is editor of the volume of Progressive Muslims on Justice, Gender and Pluralism, which offered an understanding of Islam rooted in social justice, gender equality and religious and ethnic pluralism. His latest book, Memories of Muhammad, deals with the biography and legacy of the Prophet Muhammad. Omid has been amongst the most frequently sought speakers on Islam in the popular media, appearing in the New York Times, Newsweek, Washington Post, PBS, NPR, NBC, CNN, and other international media. He also leads an educational tour every summer to Turkey to study the rich and multiple religious traditions there. The trip is open to everyone, and more information is at Illuminated Tours. So joining him in discussion is Zul Suleiman, a Vancouver-based lawyer whose legal practices focuses on immigration, refugee, and citizenship law. You can find more information at sulemanco.com. A former refugee from Uganda, he has been active in the fight against racial profiling since the events of 9-11. He was part of a movement to stop racial profiling in Canada, which included public advocacy, legislative amendments in Canada's parliament and scholarly research project, funded in part by the Law Foundation of British Columbia. Recently, he has been involved as a member of the steering group that created Canada's first Islamophobia helpline, which included support from 
the BC Civil Liberties Association and the Canadian Bar Association. He has been a member of the Mayor's Working Group on Immigration in Vancouver since 2005 and in his position has helped to develop municipal policy as a consultant and writer. He is frequent uh, in the media, commentating for a variety of regional, national and international media outlets. He writes for the National Observer and is a regular guest on Roundhouse Radio 98.3 FM. Thank you, both of you, for joining us. Zul? Thank you, Alnur. Um, Dr. Safi, I... Um I'm thrilled that we have an opportunity to uh, to discuss this case. It's a very rich mine of information and a certain kind of zeitgeist that we're in right now, I think, in North America around issues of terror uh, and radicalism. Um, I'd like to start by asking you, um, what were your initial thoughts when you were retained on the case and started to see the, the material uh, in terms of the transcriptions and the evidence, what was your initial sort of first blush uh, of what was going on here? Um, thank you. It's a wonderful opportunity to be with you and with your listeners. Um, so I came into this particular case uh, with something of a blank slate. Um, I had the advantage, if you would, of uh, not having heard about the news coverage uh around this particular episode, and I actually made a concerted effort uh, to not read anything about the case other than uh, the material that the court provided me. What I was provided with were hundreds of pages of um, undercover police operation, the RCMP, uh, and conversations that they had with Mr. Nuttall over a period of time. So all of the um, expert commentary that I provided the court were based on my close reading and analysis of these um, undercover conversations. Um, I'm happy to go in through my uh, thoughts and analysis of uh, these transcriptions in, in more detail, but uh, briefly, if I may, uh, let me say that my uh, initial uh, impression were that Mr. Nuttall presents himself as someone who is um, very much of a novice when it comes to Islam, uh, not particularly knowledgeable about the Quran or Arabic or even the very basis of Islamic practice, and that the undercover officers, um, and uh, due to legal reasons I will not be referring to them by name, um, that they make a concerted effort at every turn to discourage him and even block uh, his access to legitimate Muslim authorities. And in return, uh, they provide him with dubious and erroneous and actually discredited uh, interpretations of Islam uh, that push him towards the path of radicalization. And so all of the evidence that I provided the court were based on that particular set. And I, I want to probe that um, a, a little bit with you. This this kind of dialogue that went on between the officers and uh, and and uh, particularly uh, Mr. Nuttall, it becomes fairly early uh, in the decision. It becomes clear that these are two new converts to the faith, and that one of the things they're really struggling with is a is an age old issue that comes up in the faith of Islam, which is the role of your own decision, your own moral sphere of, of your choices that you make in the earthly plane uh, b before you leave the earth and, and, and uh, if, if you've acted according to the rules and, and hopefully go to heaven. And, and the role of, um, uh, of predestination, the role of Allah, in, in that Allah wills everything. So this tension between uh, predestination and moral choice it seems that not all in Karade were struggling with this uh, fairly early in this whole operation. And as you've said, the transcript uh, echoed, and as the judge found, uh, that they were actually impeded uh, from going on and making uh, inquiries about what's the right way to go. And so the question I guess I have for you is, do you find it uh, uh, worthy of comment that at this day and time in, in where we are in the war against Islam since 
that in a court of law, you need to explain very basic elements of what the Islamic faith is to the RCMP and the security agencies uh, of Canada. It, does this level of lack of knowledge amaze you, or what's your sense of that? Well, um, you know, I think what's important to point out here is that we're actually not dealing with individual familiarity or lack of knowledge about Islam, but rather we're speaking about systematic and institutional policies. Um, it should be pointed out that a significant number of the RCMP undercover officers themselves are Muslim. Uh, in other words, we're not speaking here of the individual familiarity or lack of familiarity with Islam, but rather the question is about policy. The question is whether an entire community uh, should be viewed with suspicion and whether these highly dubious models of so-called radicalization and countering violent extremism, quote-unquote, should be the frameworks whereby uh, an entire community should be approached, not on the basis of anything that they have done or not done, but rather simply on the basis of who they are and the faith tradition that they belong to. And, and was that your sense of what was going on in this case, is that there was a some sense of a monolithic framework of what constitutes a bad Muslim and then how to go about um, prosecuting them for their perceived conduct or conduct they're about to take on that's violent? So what is fairly clear, uh, I think, to anybody who would have the chance to read the entire document um, is the following. It's that um, Mr. Nuttall uh, identifies the main reason that he was actually drawn to Islam initially, um, not being particularly for religious purposes. Uh, he says so himself that uh, when he's drawn to Islam, it's not necessarily because he knew so much about Islam as a religious tradition. Rather, it is in the larger context of a geopolitical uh, issues of justice and injustice. Like many other people, uh, he sees what seems to be happening on a daily basis in places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Palestine, and he is moved uh, to act. He is moved to somehow uh, become involved. And he's not quite sure what that means, but that is the initial step that um, makes him want to be involved in this particular context. He receives a very rudimentary understanding of Islam, which he is very uh, aware of. And repeatedly during the course of the conversation, he keeps pointing out the fact that he doesn't really know anything about Islam, and he doesn't understand Islam very much. Um, and that's why he you know, is, is looking for uh, someone to educate him, and it's at this point that the RCMP officers become involved, and rather than directing him towards a mosque or an Islamic center or credible uh, experts on Islam, they both block his access to these legitimate, credible authorities and simultaneously position themselves as his spiritual guides. If you read through the transcripts, you see that time and time again, Mr. Nuttall says what he is looking for is, and I quote, spiritual guidance. And this theme of, 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 it actually touches upon two key themes that I think come out in your testimony and the findings of the judge, which, which you've touched on, but perhaps we can go into a little bit deeper. In this age and time that we live in, which are very complex times, one of the concerns that arises is around the lone wolf radicalized terrorist. Now, in the popular media, the way that uh, Karadeh and, and Nuttall were portrayed uh, is as if they were these uh, Islamic converts who'd somehow become violent jihadists. Uh, obviously, the judgment has found that not to be the case. But what I wanted to ask you is that this idea of jihadi behavior and what are the constitutive elements or the predictors of jihadi behavior, this came up in the judgment, and, I, and you commented on it very strongly. Could you touch upon the idea of whether jihadi behavior can be predicted, if there are such predictors, and what went wrong in this case? Yes. 
Um, so I'm going to hear the um, uh, building a little bit on the observations that I have, um, which are not purely restricted to this one case, but rather uh, about the conversations around the issue of so-called lone wolves um, in the context of North American terrorism over the last uh, few years or so. Um, there's an interesting double standard or discrepancy that we tend to notice uh, in the United States and Canada when it comes to these particular episodes. Um, we know that the overwhelming majority of acts of domestic terrorism um, in both countries are committed not by people of Muslim background, but uh, usually by white nationalist separatists, oftentimes KKK or neo orient white supremacist types of individuals. Now, what is fascinating is, for example, in the United States, on average, on average, we have uh, one case of mass shootings per day, going back a few years now. The overwhelming majority of these acts of domestic terrorism are committed by white men between the ages of 18 and 30, typically people who are socially alienated and have a tremendous obsession with guns and violence. When it is young white men who commit these acts of domestic terrorism, perhaps the most famous one being Dylan Roof recently, the young man who walked into a Charleston uh, church, the historically black A&E church in Charleston, immediately the language that is used is a lone wolf, and the individual is characterized as exactly that, an individual who perhaps suffers from mental illness, um, maybe comes from a broken home, and there's a whole narrative that's cultivated of a very sympathetic, um, if not pathetic, character uh, who commits this act of violence, but at no point does anyone expect or does this thought even get articulated for, if you would, white people or Christians or men to somehow stand up and apologize for the actions of these white terrorists who commit the majority of acts of domestic terrorism. That. Track that with the few occasions that we have had, such as San Bernardino, for example, or um, the case of Omar Mateen in the Orlando gay and lesbian nightclub shooting, uh, on the cases when it is found that there's a Muslim who commits these acts, even when it is proven that these Muslims have absolutely no connection with ISIS or with international groups of terror, immediately the conversation is cast not as a lone wolf, but rather the banner news alert of ISIS comes to America. And the question that is asked is, what is it about, quote-unquote, Islam that produces violence and terror like this? Questions that were simply never presented with in the cases of white people. So let me, let me push into, into that, that framework that you put out, and I'm just trying to challenge a little bit of what you're saying, and, and I hope you take it in that spirit. Um, the, the concern I have... Uh, from the kinds of comments that, that at least that I'm understanding, is there a sense from what you're saying and that the audience might view a conflation of gun violence in America as first of all being domestic terror and then being primarily white supremacist, while the use of the word terrorism when it's applied to Muslims um, has an ideological view of the other being a threat? Or, is there a sense that, uh, or are you trying to say that that all kind of gun violence in America is largely a white supremacist framework that attaches to it? I'm just trying to, to probe that a bit. I think I'm trying to say two things, actually. One of them is that the label terrorism, and again, I'm here primarily speaking about America, uh, that the label terrorism has almost become an empty signifier that is attached only to cases where acts of violence are committed by Muslims. 
so that you have the absurd account where a daily act of violence takes place, and it is found out that the shooter is white, and before any investigation has taken place, you see the police releasing a statement saying, don't worry, this wasn't terrorism, or that we have ruled out terrorism, right, before there has even been an investigation. What that means, and all that it means, is that from what we think, Muslims did not commit this act. I think that's one thing that I am saying. And then the second part is simply a statistical observation, which is that the majority of violent acts resulting in death, for example, involving guns, in both the United States and America, are committed by people of white ancestry, many of whom uh, are classified by human rights organizations and groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, that tracks and studies hate groups. Uh, they're classified as white supremacist hate organizations, uh, neo Aryan KKK style group. So in light of those comments, then, then I, it leaves an interesting opportunity here because the case is retrospective, right? It looks at conduct that took place, and to be clear, it's on appeal. My sense is that it may well go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada because the security forces in Canada, and by that phrase I mean uh, CISA, CSEC, the RCMP, the Canada Border Services Agency, all these groups have a huge investment uh, in using these kinds of what we call Mr. Big sting operations, which the Supreme Court has generally found to be uh, within the constitutional parameters in Canada. So there's a lot of investment here by the state of Canada in uh, figuring out where the line is in terms of entrapping or not entrapping individuals. But but in light of your comments and, and this case and looking forward, I would ask you then that if you had an opportunity to speak to the RCMP and CSIS, etc., these are the people on whose radar they seem to have a gaze. And in that gaze, people arise. These people are then seen as being problematic. They're then tracked. And then eventually... Uh, they may be arrested and, and given orders to not behave in certain ways. They may be a part of sting operations, like the one in which you are an expert. Clearly, it seems then, from what you're saying, that there is something very wrong, very, very wrong with the gaze, with the view of the security individuals who make decisions about who to follow and who to uh, actually take through these operations in assessing who's a threat and who's not. It, what would you be saying to them about how they should change their focus and, and, and who they look upon and where these resources get spent? I think what my advice to the RCMP, and again, I want to be clear about the fact that I am a scholar of Islam. I don't, uh, I'm not, you know, somebody who's, a, who's an expert on Canadian social policy. Uh, but as somebody who studies uh, both Islam as a tradition and the Muslim community, I would say that when we take a look around the world, whether we are talking about Bangladesh, Istanbul, Medina, Paris, London, Brussels, um, and, or so many other places, New York, Toronto, um, you know, we do see uh, episodes of horrific acts of violence. The best antidote that we seem to have against it is an open society where individuals are free to voice their dissent, to disagree with their government policies uh, openly and have meaningful alternatives, and that the relationship between minority community and the police authority is a relationship that is based on transparency openness and mutual trust well one of the just, one of the really elements uh, one of the elements that comes out in, that actually echoes what you're saying very clearly at paragraph 500 of the judgment uh, the, the judge says one should not be branded as a terrorist for talking about it it seems that there's this echo that the discussion of terrorism itself or the exploration of the parameters of it should not brand you as a terrorist, and yet the security agencies of, of CSIS here in Canada, the RCMP, they're tracking 
uh, internet uh, communication, they're tracking phone communication, they're tracking scholars, uh, they're tracking all sorts of individuals. So how does one deal with that tension between not uh, deeming everybody to be a terrorist who's exploring their faith, their conduct, uh, these issues from, say, a scholarly perspective, uh, and yet tracking the people that are doing bad things? Well, I think here's the way in which the more that the relationship with the Muslim community uh, is a fruitful relationship, an open, honest, and trusting relationship, we know that these sting operations where uh, the FBI or CSIS ends up radicalizing somebody only to turn around and arresting that person, therefore uh, impressing a need for the so-called system of law and order, that they're establishing, that this, this, this achieves the very opposite of that goal. It actually creates an environment of suspicion and an environment where the people are not, want, are not going to want to cooperate with the authorities. The reason that the Muslim community is important, and I think one wants to be very clear here, is not so that the Muslim community is dealt with primarily through a lens of surveillance or anti-radicalization. I think doing so uh, is so perverse, and actually um, it's counter to our own highest ideals as Canadians and as Americans. The fact of the matter is that we're all, if we're here, um, we should be treated as citizens and under a legal frame of law which presumes a certain measure of equality. What the reason that having an open and honest relationship is important is for a very simple reason. People do not tend to become radicalized in mosques and Islamic centers. One of the few generalizations that we can actually make about people who sign up to commit terrorist activities is that they tend to self-radicalize. They tend to radicalize by looking up things online, taken out of context, and interpreted outside the mainstream bulk of the Islamic tradition. It's when people go to mosques, they go to imams, or they go to qualified scholars, that they are told what the actual teachings of the Islamic tradition are, which, of course, rule out horrific actions like targeting civilians. I think that's one of the reasons that we want to have mosques and Islamic centers and scholars be open and viable and inviting resources for people. And so that that actually element comes out also quite strongly in your in in your section of the of the judgment or where the judge uh, comments upon your testimony. It seems at several junctures uh, that Nadal and Karade actually wanted to reach out uh, to imams to experts, uh, to elders, to guide them on these issues. And that, as you've already said earlier in the interview, uh, that they were actually um, uh, diverted uh, from doing that. And and so it, it raises, uh, you, you can comment on that, but, but the other issue I wanted to actually raise, going back to the idea of a, of a free dialogue in a civil society, one of the issues that came up in the judgment uh, was whether the constitutional, the charter of rights and freedoms that we have in Canada, and the practice of faith was actually breached. It was one of the arguments brought up by the defense. The judge did not find merit on it, given that the judge was already finding that entrapment had taken place. But what is your view, this idea, do you think that Nadal and Karaday's rights to exercise their religious freedoms were actually precluded in this case, that they were actually barred from fully practicing the faith that they had embraced? So I think what, the way that I would like to sort of answer that is by very specifically referring to what um, I can confirm and verify. So in the transcript, in the transcript, uh, we know that Mr. Nuttall repeatedly says that there's such and such a sheikh, a Muslim authority, and that uh, he's, he wants to get in touch with him, that he, and I quote, really, really need to speak to him. And then the undercover officer says, oh, you know, you can't just talk to him today or tomorrow. And Mr. Nuttall says, you know, what I really want to do is to go to the local mosque and ask the imam what his opinion is, you know, uh, quote, unquote. And then the undercover officer says, but you can't 
do that. That's not how it works. Uh, these are the kind of ways in which, um, you know, I think the RCMP officers were trying to dissuade him. So uh, you, 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 use only, the word, you use the word dissuade, but if I say to you obstruct, how would you respond to that word? Um, I, think, I think that's a, that's a fair reading of it. Um, you know, and it's a, you have to remember that these are conversations that unfold through uh, hundreds of pages of testimony. So it's not a one-time occasion. It is repeated reinforcement that um, I want to go talk to any mom. No, you can't go talk to any mom. I want to go to a mom. No, you can't go to a mom. And then even more so, uh, the RCMP officers are actually providing um, an erroneous argument to Mr. Nuttall stating that, um, on one hand, his own interpretation of Islam uh, is every bit as valid, as informed, as that of a Muslim scholar, um, and that uh, if he doesn't see that, then it's because he is trying to place an intermediary between himself and God, and he calls it, and I quote, bullshit. Um, And so there's also this kind of a more subtle way of obstructing uh, Mr. Nuttall's access to qualified Muslim uh, rulers and, and, and leaders. And then lastly, um, we see that the RCMP officers are also providing very dubious theological readings of Islam. So, so I gather bullshit, okay. is, uh, bullshit is not a coherent theological kind of response. Uh, I think one would be hard pressed to find a word like bullshit uh, in any <laughs> Islamic theological text. Um, but w- what's interesting is that um, uh, the, the RCMP provides an explanation to Mr. Nuttall stating that, you know, if you go ahead and you commit this act and you end up killing somebody, well, that's just what God intends to have happen. Uh, that somebody who is killed that it was the will of God for them to die, so don't feel bad about it. Right? And that kind of a view, which actually erases and eradicates human agency and accountability, is specifically a point of view that a thousand years ago was declared as heretical within classical Islamic theolo- theological thought, uh, and the balance of Islamic theology was always put on this notion that on one hand, we as human beings are free to choose our actions, and on that basis we will be held accountable. And yet, at the same time, uh, of course, you know, God is still omniscient. Um, and, you know, there was a fine balance that, that was what place. But at no point within um, mainstream classical Islamic theology is there the notion of Go ahead and do whatever you want, even if it mean, means to kill somebody. And if somebody dies, well, you know, well, it, it's too bad. The cavalier, uh, the cavalier attitude of the RCMP does come through, and in fact, the point you're making was fully endorsed in the judgment uh, by the by the justice in this case. That uh, uh, you know, this there, there was a profound misunderstanding of this core concept within the faith of Islam. But but I wanted to to move there then to sort of two other areas. One is, you say that this idea of violent behavior doesn't exist in mainstream Islamic theology, and I want to explore this idea of the mainstream. And I want to twin that with another question I have, which is that, what do you think would have happened if Corday and not all had actually sought the advice they needed? There are a lot of people who are struggling with concepts of faith and belief, not only in Islam, but in other faiths. There are new converts. You've suggested and said that actually to go and speak to imams and elders and educated people uh, would have projected a view of Islam that did not condone this kind of violence. And you've also suggested uh, in, in the comments that there's kind of a mainstream hegemony of what constitutes proper practice and engagement with the concept of jihad. Um, so talk to me about what is the mainstream and isn't. Clearly there's something on the fringes that seems to excite sure. people. And secondly... How much faith do you have that the kind of advice that these converts or people who are struggling with these concepts would actually have received more mainstream advice rather than the kind of advice uh, that actually might lead to 
a, a non-mainstream interpretation and perhaps a violent interpretation of the faith. Yeah. Uh, those, are, I think, are all very fair uh, questions, and I think what I wouldn't want to do uh, would be in the interest of countering the erroneous interpretation of Islam offered by the RCMP to end up flattening uh, the spectrum of interpretations and practices that have historically existed and continue to exist uh, within uh, Islam and Muslim societies, and instead to somehow prop up my own understanding or any other one person's uh, understanding as somehow a capital O orthodoxy. Um, I've often made this case that um, at least Sunni Islam uh, does not operate uh, like you know something that has theological council. There's no uh, pope. There's no uh, secret chamber of uh, you know men with cigars who sit around and decide what is quote unquote orthodox. Um, it is a cacophony of discussion. There is a fluid model of consensus that can shift over time, um, and you've got a thousand scholars. And if they are qualified, um, and there are methods for that qualification, they issue opinions. When it comes to, however, that sense, and it's very much like the way that, you know, classical rabbinic Judaism uh, also operates. Having said that, that, there is a spectrum of interpretations and practices in Islam should not lead one to think that anything goes. And particularly, uh, the understanding is when something is explicitly laid out in the Quran or in the teachings of the prophets, that is something that we can expect um, that somebody who would go to uh, a mosque or an Islamic center, that a qualified Muslim scholar uh, would have informed him or her about that. When it comes to the issue of jihad, particularly in a post-9-11 world. Uh, this has become something of a mantra for Muslims. Um, arguably, arguably, the most famous verse of the Quran is the one that says, uh, if you take one life, it's as if you have taken the life of whole humanity. If you save one life, it is as if you have saved the life of humanity. Uh, incidentally, the verse of the Quran that is verbatim shared with the Talmudic uh, Jewish tradition. And, you know, I think what it is very reasonable to expect that any imam, any classically trained scholar, would have informed Mr. Nuttall about that. Uh, it is very reasonable to expect that if Mr. Nuttall had the opportunity to go to a mosque and ask a scholar about what's the opinion on jihad, that a classically trained imam or scholar would have shared with him the prophet's teaching, that uh, even though fighting is permissible, uh, it is very much like classical models of Christianity. There are rules that regulate and restrict how one is supposed to fight, and the rules spelled out by the Prophet are very explicit. You cannot kill women, you cannot kill children, you cannot kill the elderly, you cannot kill civilians, you can't kill monks or rabbis, you can't poison water wells or cut down trees. You know, that's something that just comes up as verbatim and explicit in the unanimously agreed-on Hadith tradition of the Prophet, and therefore, on that basis, I would say that actually, yes, it is very reasonable to expect that whether Mr. Nuttall had gone to a Salafi mosque or a progressive mosque or a Twelver Shia mosque or an Ismaili uh, place of worship, that this is the interpretation that he would have been provided. So let me let me challenge that a little bit. You, you're saying that, that obviously there's a fluidity, there's a complexity, uh, there is no... Uh, 
uh, one voice that articulates or one community that artic articulates legitimate uh, interpretations of jihad or violence, but that there seems to be a consensus uh, of, of there not needing to be, or in fact, violent behavior is antithetical uh, to what uh, the Prophet and, and what, what the Quran uh, says. However, uh, violence is occurring. Clearly, there is something happening without policing the contours of what is the hegemony or the acceptable views of Islam, something is happening within the contours of this debate that seems to be leading some people to act with deep violence uh, against all humans. Um, how would you articulate what it is that then, without, without policing the contours of the legitimacy of the faith, how would you then deal with the issue of what is it that is uh, triggering or perhaps playing a role in the violent conduct of some people who identify themselves as Muslim and who identify themselves as properly engaging with the faith? Um, I never dispute the fact that you have Muslims who are committing uh, atrocious acts of violence in the world, just as uh, hopefully no one will deny that there are Muslims who are committing extraordinary acts of kindness, both at a public and exceedingly private and subtle way. What I am contesting, and I do stand by this, is that you have Muslims who can commit and are committing, and perhaps will continue to commit for the near future, extraordinary acts of hideous violence. That does not grant them the license to say that their actions are consistent with the norms of the Islamic tradition. We do know that groups like ISIS are desperate to claim the mantle of religious legitimacy and authority. They simply do not deserve it when every bit of their action, not just the goals that they aspire to, but the very means that they use to pursue those actions, are in violation of both the spirit and the letter of Islam. That legitimacy is something that they crave, but they do not deserve. So let's bring the dialogue back to, to kind of where we started in terms of you, the expert, and, and this particular case. As someone yes. who um, is accepted as an expert, as someone who is uh, very learned, and, and I thank you for sharing your, your time with us today, um, who then gets projected into the public sphere, it sounds to me that you too struggle, that, that you, uh, the expert, struggles in how you project Islam into the sphere in which we live, not only in this case the judicial sphere, where what you say and don't say, uh, has a profound effect. In this case, I think it will have a profound effect on how Canada moves forward with terrorism-type sting operations. But also in the other work you do, if you don't want to police the faith and you don't want to police the contours of the faith, what challenges do you face as an expert when you're put on the stand and actually have to articulate what is Islam, how is it practiced, um, and what happened in this particular case? Was it Islamic conduct or not? What what sort of struggles do you go through with that? You know, I think uh, that's a very good question. And um, I think I approach these questions um, as someone who, like all of us, has identities that are fluid and multi-layered. So at no point during my analysis or expert testimony do I stop being a citizen. I'm always a citizen. Uh, at no point do I stop being uh, a scholar of Islam. At no point do I stop being a Muslim, or male, or straight, or a son, or a father, or a friend, and a teacher, a neighbor. Um, you know, all of us have these identities that are subtle and fluid, and my own notion of a public space is actually one in which we come into the public space with the fullness of what makes us human um, through our particularity, not by erasing and eradicating and exiling our distinctions and our particularity. You come through the fullness of who you are, and so will I, and so will he, and so will she. Um, and there is, you know, there's that cacophony that can become a symphony uh, there is that 
togetherness and that we-ness that is greater than each one of our own. Um, and the fact that there are tensions within each one of our own public uh, and private personas, this is something that I actually accept. Uh, and the tests that I try to apply in every second of these kinds of conversation is, are we telling the truth? Uh, is what we are saying something that I would say elsewhere? Is the way that I characterize uh, the Prophet's understanding of jihad something that if I were giving that same talk in an academic conference, or if I were giving it in a mosque setting, or in a courtroom setting? So given... given would, I, would I stand by that? Given the complexity of the intersectional identity you've identified for yourself, um, clearly you're cognizant of, of where your voice echoes. But, but I just want to ask one last question, which is that surely your voice echoes much louder than the voices of others, given your positionality in the dynamic of power, faith, the academy, let alone your personal identities. Um, do you accept that your voice echoes more, and does that affect how you echo your voice out there in the, in the dynamic spheres in which you function? Um, everybody has a voice. Um, and some voices are, at the moment, weakened and even deliberately silenced. That's why, um, you know, in the United States, the Black National Anthem has this beautiful line about lift every voice and sing. Uh, and that's something that I take on very seriously as a citizen who's devoted to notions of social justice. Uh, I think for those of us who do have the privilege of having a platform, uh, and you're right, I am blessed in that sense uh, of being a teacher and a writer and someone who gets invited on these kinds of um, uh, platforms to, to speak, um, and it wasn't, by the way, a piece of cake. It was four days on the witness stand, uh, which is pretty grueling, I have to say. Um, the, uh, I think my obligation is, are we telling the truth, and are we somehow making sure that we are shining the light on the life and reality of people who may not be able to speak for themselves? In, in, and I think as a teacher, as a public intellectual, that's something that I oftentimes try to come back to. I, I appreciate the ethical way in which you struggle with this. It's, um, it's a real challenge, you know, and it's interesting to hear that struggle in your voice as, as you articulate it. Um, so let's, let's then go from um, the idea of you, a person who is an expert position in these various dialogues, and let's take it back out to the larger issues of... Um, um, of um, the global war against Islam, the war of terror that will apparently never end. Um, if, in fact, we see in this case a real failure uh, of Canadian security agencies, and it's shocking that after 9-11 we're still struggling with this level of ignorance, um, how does that ignorance, then, you think, play out with the securitization of the Muslim faith, the Muslim body, the scrutiny of the Muslim, as the Muslim weaves in and out of borders, but also is resident in what we call home, whether that's the, the idea of the USA or Canada or other parts of the world. Do you find this level of misunderstanding of where um, the, main, the main articulation, the main kind of consensus of the faith being nonviolent, um, how Western security agencies are dealing then uh, with the, the, the specter of Muslim terror? Are you surprised by the Canadian approach? You know, um, this is now we're moving on to a realm well beyond um, this expert witness testimony. But let me say that as um, somebody who's committed to issues of social justice and public intellectual activity, um, my starting framework is very simple. It's that um, every single life is sacred. Uh, every single life is something that contains uh, divine spirit and is worthy, inherently worthy, of dignity. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're shining a light on that human suffering, whether it is caused by agents of Muslim terror or 
as is often the case, in the significantly larger number of people who are the recipients of state-sponsored, state-sanctioned terror, including terror that is committed by, supported by, paid for, legally protected um, actions of Western states, including the United States and Canada. Um, and in those cases, I want to make sure that our securitization framework doesn't whitewash and cover up the dignity and sanctity of lives of human beings in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, and Palestine, and lots of other states where the United States leads the coalition, which gives itself the right to drone human beings to death, to occupy them, to bomb them, to sanction them. I see upholding of the sanctity of those lives every bit as necessary and as worthy of an action for human beings, including Muslims, as I do the actions of protecting the lives of people in the United States and Canada. Well, I thank you for your uh, your comments. It's been a great conversation. I, I hope we have more, and I, I thank you for sharing your um, uh, your views on not only your testimony, but the larger issues involved. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You have been listening to a discussion between Professor Omid Safi, commissioned by the defense as an expert witness in the so-called Canada Day bomb plot, and immigration lawyer Zul Suleiman, discussing and analyzing the legal processes and outcomes of the John Nuttall and Amanda Crody case. The presiding judge, Madam Justice Bruce, ultimately concluded there was an abusive process, legalities, and an inducement of an offense by the RCMP, subsequently throwing the case out of court citing entrapment. This discussion has been a part of a series titled Unpacking Anti-Terrorism, presenting discussion and analysis by leading Muslims from diverse backgrounds on the effects of anti-terror laws on Canadian society in general and on Muslims and their communities communities in particular. Contributing authors include legal experts, public intellectuals, politicians, senators, community organizations, as well as individuals and family members directly affected by the post-9-11 anti-terror security legislation regimes. For more information about this series, email unpackingantiterror at gmail.com. This series is produced by Al Gova. Special thanks to Anushka Azadi, Elwin Z, Molly Karen, and Kelly Reburn.